You're watching The Ready Writer, a show where I get to speak to writers of all different genres, mediums, and experiences. The Ready Writer. Are you ready? It is time for another episode of The Ready Writer. I'm your host, Casey Bell, and Jim Keen is my guest that I have today. Let's get started. So did you grow up as a writer? Did you want to be a writer when you were a child? Or is this something that just started? Or what age did this whole writing venture begin for you? Well, in a short answer, I didn't grow up wanting to be a writer at all. Um, and I'll give you a slightly longer answer to that now. As I grew up in Manchester, which is a town in the north of England, um, it's on the outskirts of Manchester. Um, and in the uh, 70s and 80s, Manchester was really going through a rough point. It was transitioning from an industrial, industrial city to a post-industrial. So I was surrounded by a lot of empty factories. It has very high unemployment, low incomes, a very working class place. I mean, it's no coincidence the Smiths and the Joy Division kind of came out of that environment. Both of them came out from a few square miles of where I lived. So doing anything remotely artistic as a career just was just not an option. And it wasn't, it wasn't like uh, told that you couldn't do it. It was just no one even mentioned being a painter or an author or a musician. Everything was about getting a career, you know, getting a job that, you know, you wouldn't lose, being a plumber or something like that. And so I, I had a really clear recollection of um, my dad saying I couldn't be a comic artist, which is what I wanted to be. And I needed to get like, a, you know, get a grown up job, something, you know, something that'll keep you going, which I can understand now being a dad. He just wanted me to have an income. Um, and so I went into the school library and I got a book of careers and I literally went through it until I could find a career that I thought would appease him um, and had some art base to it. And it was architecture um, right there under A at the start of the book almost. And so uh, I spent 20 years in architect, um, whole time, never really wanting to be an architect, but at the same time having a really fun time. And it meant I got to work in Australia for a year um, and then New York for a year. And then I was spent 10 years in London. Um, and I worked for a company called Grimshaw, which does uh, like the, the Fulton Street Transit Center in, in Manhattan and the US Star Terminal in Waterloo. So big industrial high-tech buildings. And it, it was great. Um, but I found like after 10 years of that, I was just bored really, kind of felt a bit of a loss. And so I started to think again about what I wanted to do. And I, I knew I wanted to draw comics, but at that point I hadn't drawn into you know, 15 years. I was nowhere near good enough. And so I just sat down and wrote a book. Um, and uh, it was rubbish. I sent it out and I got the, uh, the rejections that you get from an agent, you know, just saying, they said, we like the story, but it's the writing is like a five-year-old. Um, so I then went and worked really hard on my craft and I wrote a second novel, sent that out. And then the replies were, it's you know, it's well written, but the, the story's boring because I'd gone all the other way to that. Um, and so I, there was at the same time, Tor, the publisher of sci-fi books, uh, had a competition for sci-fi authors to submit a new novel. And so I, I wrote half a novel um, and I submitted it and I never thought, they would be interested, but I got to be a finalist. And so then I had to write the second half of the novel while I was on vacation um, with my wife, which as you can imagine was, you know, went over perfectly. But I, I finished the book, didn't win. It was a runner up, which is great. But at that point, um, it turned out that my wife was pregnant and I had that thing again, that kind of working class upbringing of like, I have to get a job, have to get a job, have to provide, you know, look after my kids. And so I, I spent the next 10 years as an architect again never really enjoying it, but trying, trying and trying and trying not to be an author. Um, and then I, then I got fired because I was just not, couldn't be bothered to be an architect and then I started writing again. So really it's been a case of 10 years, not writing, five years writing, 10 years, not writing. And now five years writing again. And that's where I am. That's, I like that story. Yeah. I'm really Amazing envious journey. of people. Yeah, I'm really envious. I'm, I'm sure you know many people that wanted to be a writer when they were six and they wrote the first novel when they were eight. And by the time they were 15, they'd written a trilogy. I, 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 would, I would love to be that, but it wasn't me at all. It wasn't me at all. How about so, yourself? Um, well, 
I was writing since I was a child, but I didn't become a writer until I'd say 2007, but I didn't accept myself as a writer until two years ago, so. Yeah, it's amazing how people are unwilling to say they're a writer, right? It's almost like, you know, it's almost like an embarrassing thing, especially because I don't know about you, people immediately say to me, oh, what have you written? Have I heard of it? Like, well, for me, we'll never it hear was it. Yeah. more so, like you said, they, I've been told, uh, I was told, well, I got a lot of C's and D's in English class. And when I submitted my work, I was told it was a great story, but you're a horrible writer. So that's why I never actually considered myself a writer because of the experts telling me I wasn't. Um, so what actually, I guess just your boredom of architect forced you into publishing a book? What encouraged you to actually do it? Well, I, I, I missed it. First of all, it was something that I, when I wasn't writing, I always wanted to be writing. A um, bit of a daydreamer, I think. And then, as I said, I lost my job. And um, my wife at the time was very supportive. And she said, you know, you don't be an architect. We don't want to be it. Take this opportunity to do something else. Um, and so I just started to write again. I, I started, first of all, I started doing illustrations, like hand drawings for architects. That's a way to make a, a, way to make a living. And that went surprisingly well and within a couple of years I was featured on the Apple website working with a developer um, doing kind of electronic hand drawings um, and that provided the income then to write part-time um, and then I, I wrote a novel um, based around uh, automation and unemployment and I decided after thinking about it carefully to self-publish and so that's been the process really. Um, and I wrote, um, and, you know, I've written two, another two novels since then. Oh, okay. So you said, well, obviously you first started out by submitting your work and now you're self-published. So what are some things you learned during the publishing process? Because I know for myself, there was a lot of things I didn't know that shocked and surprised me. So what were some things you learned during the process? And how did you know about self-publishing? And what did you, how did you know what to do how did you learn? Yeah, I mean, it, it was started off more of a case of knowing what I didn't want to do. Um, and I'd been down the process of applying um, to agents for a very long time when I was previously doing my book, books. Um, and I got an agent at the time, but it seemed to me the process was really geared towards publishing trades. And in the 10 years I hadn't been writing, that had completely flipped on its head. Um, and Amazon had come in with a Kindle and then subsequently Apple and Barnes and Noble, companies like that. And they really made it, a, you know, they'd lowered the bar of entry and made it a whole new way to get published. So I, when I finished the new book I'd written, I started to, to submit um, to agents. And again, and I got interest and I was in discussions to get, you know, get an agent. And then I just felt that the process of applying to an agent, having to rewrite the book to satisfy them, and then apply for a publisher, uh, you know, and then they may have changes, and then you get a tiny advance because I'm, I'm I'm a nobody, and then having to do all that again, well, you know, and again and again to try and build up an audience, to me seemed like quite a, an old-fashioned way of publishing. So I just did a Google search for for electronic publishing. I, it was just something I did when I was bored one day, and then I saw there was this whole world out there of, of indie publishing these days. Um, and I found a, a podcast by a guy called Mark Dawson, who is very well known in the self-publishing industry. Um, and I just read the books he'd written about self-publishing and, and then followed the courses he'd done online. And one thing led to another, and I found it, it is easy to self-publish. It takes time. You have to do it all yourself, you know, all the covers, the blurbs, setting up the websites, all that stuff. But once you've done it, it it's really satisfying. And I think one of the the biggest changes um, in the kind of the ten, that 10 years was, I think how the publishing industry, the traditional publishing industry is contracted in scale and they're tending to really focus on very famous authors and all very famous celebrities. So if you go to a bookstore these days, you know, you have the big table at the front with all the books on, that's very well lit. And then you may have your JK Rowling stand and your Stephen King stand, which, you know, great. But then right at the back, it's the, it's the wall 
with hundreds of books on it by authors like, you know, like myself, like the unheard of people. And you really expect it, traditional publishers these days seem to expect you to do a lot of the marketing yourself. So to have your own website, have your own mailing lists, you know, go on blogs and all that sort of stuff. And I thought, if I'm doing that, then why don't I just do it for my own work? As opposed to giving 90% of the income to somebody I never meet. You know, so indie publishing, you don't get the, uh, the recognition in bookstores unless you're very big. But the opportunity to make a living out of it is far easier. And so that was why I went down that route, I think. Um, you said traditional publishing expects you to do your own marketing. Um, if you, you can't even hire a publicist or a marketing team today without them asking you, without them, like you can't hire them unless you can prove to them you're going to help them. And I find yes. that odd because yes. if you yep. need someone to mow your lawn, they're not expecting you to help them. If you need a, a plumber, he's not expecting to help you. But with this job, apparently they want to know, what are you going to do to help us? And I'm like, when I first, when they first asked me that, I wanted to say, I was hiring you. That's what I was going to do to help myself. But yeah. I didn't. I just said, oh, um, let me think about it. I'll get back to you. And I never got back to them because I didn't, it didn't make sense to me for me to be paying you thousands of dollars. And you're, I'm like, then I might as well keep that money for myself and do it for myself. No, so I think absolutely. it's weird like how it's one, changed. Yeah. Like one of the, the questions that I was asked to put in application letters to agents was the size of my social media following. And clearly, let's say I had a million people following me on Twitter, then I'm sure they're much more likely to give you a book contract because, you know, you, you could got, got the avenue of selling the book. But on the other hand, if I had a million followers on Twitter, I don't need to go to additional publisher. I could sell it myself. So like you, I, I found the whole thing quite weird in that way. Let's talk about your book, Paradise Factory. Um, what is the brief summary without giving away any too much? <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's sci-fi, and I, it's set 30 years time in the future in New York. And I think, like a lot of sci-fi, there's two parts to it. There's the world it's set in, and then there's the plot of the story. Um, so after I lost my job, um, I just happened to read a, a paper that was released by the previous White House, the Obama White House, about automation and AI. These are things that you've been interested in, you know, in my whole life and watching science fiction. Um, and it was a genuinely terrifying document to read because it states without any question that AI and automation are coming, whether it's coming five years time or 10 years time or 20 years time, we don't know. But when it's here, it's gonna have a huge impact upon the, the economy and the job market that we know about. And in, in that document, they were talking about 30 to 50% of jobs being replaced by machines within five years of rollout, which is crazy when you think about it. Um, and, you know, and obviously there's hope that there will be new jobs created to replace those like what happened in the last industrial revolution. But if there isn't, what do those people do? You know, and in Europe, the, there's the uh, um, universal basis in, basic income where the government will give people uh, a larger employment, uh, unemployment benefit to survive on because it, there's no jobs around. I don't think that would happen in America. I think it's hard to see the government here paying people uh, an unemployment benefit that would enable them to live for years on end because there's no work. So I took that idea and just made it more extreme. I made it so that there was complete unemployment, like 99% unemployment and no social systems. So the 1%, the, the people who make the machines and the AIs live in mile high towers in splendid isolation, their lives are fantastic. And then everybody else like you and me was stuck at ground level. Um, with no one to help us apart from the police. And the police are basically a peacekeeping force just to you know, keep a lid on everything. And in the place of all social services, organized crime has risen to, to fill those voids in a very similar way to how organized crime arose in New York, you know, 150, 200 years ago. Um, and so I took the names of those gangs and the names of the people around those gangs, and I made them the adversaries at ground level in competition with the cops. And so that's kind of the basic dynamic set up between the good guys and the bad guys with everybody else living over their heads. Um, and so this book, the first one, I wanted to keep it really simple in terms of the story, make it a very fast paced kind of journey through that world. 
And so it starts off with like the protagonist of my series, um, a woman called Alice Yu. Um, and she's out on a patrol with her partner, they're cops, and they get uh, attacked and he gets kidnapped and he gets taken into uh, the, the worst law-free zone in all of uh, New York City, which is the Brooklyn Bridge. And it's, it's a no-go zone for cops. And she's told if she goes in there to get a partner back, she will lose her job and then become an unemployed person herself. But she decides loyalty is to her friend is worth more than that. So she has to go into the wreckage of the Brooklyn Bridge and save her friend. And that's what the story's about. Yeah. And it doesn't end well for a lot of people. <laughs> you said, did I hear you say it's a series, the book? Yeah, uh, so yes, I wrote the sequel called This Automatic Eden, which is set a year after the event of the first one because Alice loses her job because of what she did in the first book. And it's looking about how she's surviving then in this world of unemployment. Um, and then she gets called back to help out with an investigation into a gang member she used to know. And then um, I'm almost written the third book now, The Genesis Engine, which is looking more at um, people who live in the towers. What's it like for the 1% who spend their entire life interacting with machines and AI as opposed to human beings? So I'm trying to build out the world now, make it more involving that way. Do you have an idea of how many you think will be in the series? Or are you just writing it until you're done with it? So in, in um, indie publishing, you're advised to write a series because once one person buys book one, if they like it, they'll likely buy book two, book three, and book four. And that's how you build up an audience. Um, I, that, to a certain extent, you know, I like to do that, but I also want to write different things as well. So this third book will be the completion of this trilogy. And then I'm going to write another trilogy based on a different character, but in the same, in the same world. And I'll have interactions with the characters, but that's going to be um, more about uh, off-world activities, things going on in Mars and Europa and places like that. So I'm trying to build up a, a whole world to write in and then do individual trilogies set within that. That's the plan right now. We'll see how that works out. Interesting. Okay, so your last question. Think of an author, dead or alive, that you would like to meet. If you could take a train ride with them, which author would it be? Where would you go and why? Right, it's, this is a brilliant question. Absolutely brilliant question. Um, and there's like two parts to it. It's like, I think what would be the most fun and what would be the most interesting, right? And so, uh, a large part of me would say to go anywhere with Hemingway on a train would be a would be a blast because that guy could drink a lot and having you know tequila and martinis on him for a couple, a couple of hours would be a lot of fun and his his writing style is is exquisite and massively influential on me. I think his books are dated, but the way that he changed industry was amazing. But if I had to pick one person, it would be William Gibson um, on a bullet train in Japan going to Tokyo because I, I think he's a, the greatest living author right now. His, his use of the language is incredible. And it's a, a, you know, applied to stories whose imagination and vision are a, a huge, you know, huge talent. Um, and I'd like to talk to him, like just after he got his first book published, Neuromancer, was the first book to do with, you know, cyberspace and AI and virtual realities. And, you know, how did he come up with all of that? And what's it like? writing that work and did he know he was writing a book at the time that was going to define an entire generation of science fiction works so it'd be him you know i mean even now he's still writing amazing books you know it takes him five years to write 150 pages but you know it's worth it when it's that good how about yourself okay. what would you what would your answer to that be i don't have one Oh, I know. I know. I the the thing is, I've seen interviews because I like watching musicians and celebrities um, be interviewed, and some of them are like from Motown, nineteen sixties, and I see them answering the same questions over and over and over again. And I kind of said, if I ever become a, a talk show host or an interviewer, I would want to come up with questions that they've never heard, and so. Right. That is one of the, I ask, I have a lot of shows on my channel and I ask similar questions. Like I ask musicians, if you could um, collaborate or do a duet with someone dead or alive, who would it be? Or 
if you could co-write a book with someone? And it's just because no one's ever asked that question. That's why I ask it. But I myself can't answer that question when it comes to authors, because even though I read a lot, I don't really read one author per se. I read more yeah. on topic than author. But to be fair, I guess, the answer I have answered a lot with would be uh, Agatha Christie only because I'm huge on mystery and whodunits. And um, when it comes to television, that is mainly all I want. Well, I don't watch television, I watch Amazon Prime, but that's mainly what I watch is whodunit. And I enjoy how Agatha Christie, well, for me personally, how she always gets me, how I can never figure out who did it in her books. Where would yeah, I go? Don't know. Yeah. <laughs> right, no, she's genius. But, you know, her and, and Charles Dickens and Arthur Conan Doyle, that was the stuff I read when I, when I was younger. And I absolutely loved it. So, yeah, good call. Good call. And I think she'd be a fun person to hang out with as well. Yes. Yeah. Especially yes. the time frame she was writing in and stuff she was writing, it's great. The Paradise Factory is the post founding first book in the Cortex science fiction series. If you like gritty heroines, devious AI, and dystopian high tech worlds, then you'll love Jim Keane's action packed adventure. Thank you for taking the time to watch another episode of The Ready Writer. I would like to also thank our guest, Jim Keen, for taking the time to share his journey and his story with us. Don't forget to subscribe and share. Have yourself a wonderful day.